Great. Hello, everyone. I'm Joanne Gabriel, and on behalf of Darien Library, I want to welcome you to this evening's program, The Florida Keys, Century Old Bridge, gets a makeover with our presenter, Tony Parate. We will travel to Florida and learn about Henry Flagler's construction of the famous eighth wonder of the world, the Key West Railroad Extension and its Seven Mile Bridge. Before we begin, I would like to mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by the annual Friends of the Library Campaign. We thank you for your support to make programs like this possible and our collections available to the community. Our presenter this evening has, tra has, been, has traveled the world working as a correspondent and writer for numerous publications. He has covered the Shining Path War in Peru, drug running in Colombia, and several military rebellions in Argentina. He's the author of six books on travel. The most recent one is Cuba, Cuba Libre, Che Fidel, and the Improbable Revolution that Changed World History. He is a regular television guest on the History Channel, where he has spoken about everything from the Crusades to the birth of disco. Please welcome Tony Paratet. Hello, everyone. Hi. This is, I keep waiting for like a round of applause or something. I don't do these Zoom things so, uh, so often, but thank you for coming, uh, or whatever the, the, the right verb is. Uh, yeah, I wanted to talk, um, uh, I was going to start by talking a little bit about my own uh, experience, because the, the story you can see on the Smithsonian Magazine, it, it was the result of two trips. And the first uh, was uh, back in uh, January 2021. And that's when I, uh, I hadn't been down to the Keys before. I was in Miami and I did the classic uh, road trip uh, south, uh, you know, 150 miles south of uh, Miami uh, to Key West. And uh, like most people, I just sort of uh, set off and uh, did it in about four hours. You just sort of go down. It's incredibly spectacular. You're going across the highway and uh, all these things sort of zoom past, but you don't really pay attention to them. But at a certain point, you're going across and you're... I, I was looking at this parallel road and there's no, there was no traffic on it. And it was like, there's a very strange experience. Like there's the new road and the old road. And I thought, that's, that's curious. And then when I was in Key West, I was asking um, one of the uh, uh, people who work in the, in the, the, the city there in the government, uh, what that was. And they said, oh, that's the, that's the old highway that, uh, you know, was replaced in the eighties. Uh, and then they also said that it used to be a, um, uh, a, tr a, a train line uh, back in the Gilded Age. And I, and I found this quite, quite extraordinary because I hadn't heard anything about it. And they said one of the places that I had passed was Pigeon Island. And uh, they, were, they were fixing up a section of the line there so that people could walk back and forth. It was like, the, it was called the Old Seven. So this is the first time I'd heard about this and I wanted to go out there but because of the renovations, I couldn't do it. So anyway, years sort of went by and I, I kept this in my head. And then um, last January, I heard that finally, after some delays, they were reopening it. And I was doing a little bit of research on what this, this thing actually was. And as you can see here, it's, uh, this is like the classic promotional image from this, this railway uh, that opened in January uh, 1912. And the, it, it was kind of extraordinary to think of the experience, because uh, as, as, as you heard, it was like the eighth wonder of the world. The idea of this, this extraordinary thing, it was like something out of a novel from uh, Jules Verne. You'd sort of be going across this, these series of bridges. There's, eight, there's actually 40 of them from, you know, built across the Keys uh, down to Key West. And people could actually, like myself, in winter, go to uh, Penn Station and buy a ticket and get a luxury luxury compartment on the Havana special train, which would, uh, I found the, the schedule as well, which was kind of fun. It would leave at 10.05 every night and it would go down the Atlantic coast, uh, take 36 hours and it would go to Miami. And these are the first people who were going to Florida. So it was very exciting. They would be served uh, the great, the, the seafood and this beautiful fruit, you know, pineapples that were extremely rare in, in those days. And you'd end up at around dawn um, on the second day in Miami. And after a little bit of a, a wait, it set off on what was the, had become this sort of legendary, uh, this legendary stretch that was called the Key West Extension. And that was a single train, train track that would go uh, all the way down to, um, uh, you know, the, to, to Key West. 
and it would go 15 miles an hour, uh, which was at the time, you know, quite something across this sort of thing. They thought if you went any further, it would be dangerous. It would like teeter off the bridge. And it was this incredibly spectacular experience. And the most famous part across the seven mile, uh, the seven mile bridge was that you were able to look on either side of the carriage and look down and you would see the water. This, this beautiful, you know, if anyone's been down to the Florida Keys, incredible turquoise water. And you could spot uh, fish, sharks, stingrays, turtles, all, all these sort of extraordinary things down 65 feet below. And it was the long, this, this seven mile bridge was the longest freestanding bridge that, that, that had ever been created with this, all these uh, concrete um, pylons, as you can see, embedded. So it was um, kind of this extraordinary idea. And, I, and uh, you know, it, it, it was like John Don Passos, uh, for example, the writer called it his, a dream journey. And uh, the most extraordinary thing I thought was you could actually, because I'd been doing a book on Cuba, the, the, the train would go into the docks in Key West, this very, very long dock. And so you would get out and you would go straight onto a, a, a steamer that would go straight down to Havana overnight. So you would suddenly end up going from New York to, to Cuba in a very, very short uh, amount of time. It really was like science fiction. Now, um, it was the brainchild of, uh, of this uh, robber baron, Henry Flagler, as I discovered, uh, who used to be uh, quite famous. He was used to be, um, as, you know, he was on up there with the Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller, and the other, and the, you know, uh, people on Morgan and all the other, uh, and the Carnegies, all the other robber barons that, uh, uh, whose names are all over, all, all over buildings in New York and, uh, and Boston and San Francisco. And, um, so the extraordinary thing was he put $27 million into this, into this extension. And the more I read about it, uh, this seven-year plan to build this thing, it was, it was plagued by disasters, an extremely difficult engineering feat. And it was, there were so many things went wrong. It was known as Flagler's Folly. And most people didn't think it was actually going to be, uh, going to be completed. And yet he did it uh, you know, in, in this extraordinary way. And it's opened in um, January 1912. Another thing that I thought was kind of funny is that it was, well, not funny, but uh, uh, extraordinary. It, was, it, it opened like three months before the sinking of the Titanic. So in this gilded age, this sort of era of great optimism and this, you know, this man against nature uh, battle, uh, it, it, you know, it became a similar sort of symbol of uh, in this overreaching uh experience because uh it, it it lasted for 23 years i discovered and then um a huge hurricane hit in 1935 killed about 600 people wiped the um the whole uh, railroad off i describe it as like from the photographs i'll show some later like a like a string of spaghetti it just tossed the railroad um off the tracks so it's this extraordinary thing um and then it was paved over as a highway and, and which, you know, we knew and, you know, which people, you can see it in movies and things like that. Like I think in, um, uh, there's Arnold Schwarzenegger movies where there's car chases along this very, it was a very narrow highway. And then in the eighties, they finally replaced it with the new one. And yet the extraordinary thing is that the, the remains of the old one um, survive. It's a bit like a, I describe it as a capitalist Stonehenge. You see them and they're very, very impressive. Um, so anyway, one of the one of the things that I you know the thing that is, is the most exciting is that this this one stretch, this two point two mile stretch, the um the seven uh, the part of the seven mile bridge, obviously uh, around Marathon with, uh, to Pigeon Key was maintained. That it was always you know always kept open, and it became sort of beloved down in the Keys. Uh, people would go uh, hiking and running and fishing, and uh, uh, you know it was sort of a a, a linear park, but um. It was, but the problem was it was sort of falling to bits. So eventually, in 2016, they had to close it, and this this major renovation started. Um, so, for me, what I wanted to do was to uh, take a road trip, a second road trip, and to sort of visit this place as well as to get more of a sense of what uh, uh, what it was like. Take it. It took like this time. I took instead of four hours, I took four days. Uh, and that was a different story I wrote for the Wall Street Journal about taking it a little more easily down the keys um, and getting into the the, the ambiance because uh, the temptation to go super fast is it's, it's almost irresistible. But there's little little places along the you know many along the way, uh, 
And it's kind of the, the fun thing, I think, is you start in Miami, uh, which is one of the, you know, this, this city that now it's hard to imagine, but back in um, 1912, it was, it was a little more than a fishing village. And uh, uh, Flagler managed to put through the first, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, train line down the uh, East Coast um, to Miami and changed it in 1893. And there was another robber baron who's, not, who's also not terribly well known, the name of Henry Plant. And uh, he started doing, putting the train line down the, um, the West Coast, the Gulf Coast. But, it's, uh, but it was really um, Flagler whose who's work you know, really opened up Florida and started all these um, snowbirds, you know, the first snowbirds coming down from New York. Uh, and Flagler, he based himself in another place that it basically didn't exist uh, at Palm Beach uh, there. And, uh, you know, he's basically created one town after the next. And in each place, he opened uh, a beautiful hotel. Uh, in Miami, the closest thing is the Biltmore, uh, which uh, opened in the 19, you know, in the early 1920s. But as the historian there said, it would never have they could never have done that without uh, the, the the train line that uh, Flagler had put through. Uh, so you know, it's a lovely experience going there. You can see this is a swimming pool. It was the largest swimming pool in the United States. It's just a great way to start off uh, a trip. And um, of course, Al Capone used to stay here in the 20s. Uh, it was a great boon for the railroads, uh, the prohibition, because um, everyone would come down from the Northeast, uh, hang out in Miami, which is somewhat lawless in those days, and then go over to Cuba, which was totally um, open uh, and alcohol-wise and party-wise. So um, uh, the, this is also this is the interior of the uh, of the Biltmore. I just think any history lover uh, should really uh, check it out. They've got little, little aviaries there and all the original grand. Uh, uh, architecture, and funnily enough, the place was used as a, closed and used for decades as a hospital after the Second World War, and was only renovated again in the 90s, but uh, it's quite a, quite a wonderful experience. And so you pick up your car there and you can head off uh, down through, um, down, down south, and you start to, you, you know, go on the, the keys, this is another one of the bridges that you start to see there. Uh, you know, and it's sort of, the road sort of zooms in, in, and, in and out a little bit. And uh, uh, it can be a little bit of hard work to sort of quite get back to the, um, the, the, the frontier feeling that uh, would have been around in 1912. Because then in, that, in those days, a few fishermen would go down, like John Don Passos and Hemingway and, uh, you know, others would go down there in the little fishing camps around. And there's small little settlements, but it really was kind of uh, the last frontier of travel. Uh, and you can get a sense of it uh, from some of these uh, these little these little keys around. There's 882 keys, and the name comes from the Spanish Cayo, which is a little, little island. But some of them, uh, you know, like teeny, teeny, teensy, weensy, like this. And in fact, the number is always under dispute because hurricanes will you know, knock some down, and others will emerge, and there's these clumps of clumps of coral. But um, there's there's about 30 that are inhabited. Uh, and some of them are bewildering. Uh, I talk a bit about um, Key Largo, which is the first one you get to. And that's uh, the first key. And it's been very developed. And it's kind of uh, a sort of tragic because the movie, the great movie uh, with um, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, uh, the, this, the film noir, it's extremely evocative. But a lot of it, most of it was shot in Los Angeles in a film studio. And today it's kind of hard to get that, uh, that, that image. So the good thing about stopping on the way is you can go and you can rent little boats and get out to some of these, you know, old Florida places. And my favorite, um, oh, hang on, I've lost it. Okay. There was another um, image of uh, uh, a place that, um, it'll come up later, I think, but it out of order, uh, but a place called Alabama Jacks that you can go to. It's sort of a, a little bar that uh, Hemingway would have loved. It's right on the, um, it's basically just, the, you know, the, as you get off, you, you can sort of detour off the main highway and it's this, this beautiful bar that juts out over the, uh, uh, the water and you hear this, the, the, the fish leaping around out there and it's the only, it's completely open to the, to the air and the only decoration is license plates hammered onto, hammered onto the wall and stuffed um, tarp on fish. Anyway, but uh, so you go down 68 miles and um, you end up at uh, Marathon, which was actually 13 little keys that were sort of joined up together. And um, you can sort of uh, 
it, it, you know, there's a, and from Marathon, you can stay in, there's a beautiful place that I stayed in called the Isla Bella Resort. And it was, it's fairly new. Um, but uh, the, the islands, the, the sort of selection of islands was named uh, Marathon because um, one of the workers back in 1908, when they started, uh, started working, uh, had made this remark that uh, building the railroad has been a regular marathon which is um, an extreme understatement because it uh, had already been sort of extreme, very, very difficult. But um, it was very, the area was quite famous because um, in the 1830s, uh, John James Audubon, the great uh, watercolor, the great artist who did watercolor, watercolors of uh, birds uh, came down there and he went on hunting expeditions to get his birds. And uh, just although he's known as a great conservationist, he would shoot hundreds, if not thousands of birds on these ex expeditions and pack them and bring them back to New York so he could paint them from life. Uh, the reason I mention this is if you go into the Isla Bella Resort, they have these beautiful um, paintings of, uh, uh, of the whole thing. So you can, so from the resort, you literally walk a hundred yards across the, you know, you're under the highway and this little walkway and you go up to this extraordinary thing. And as you can see here, is this dire straits um, bridge that, um, you know, you can, you can go on to. And it's, a, it's, it's this great sort of um, step back in time. It's, this is when it just opened. So it's quite, uh, it's quite empty, but it's got the little bike lane and whatever. Uh, and it's sort of very, you know, I compare it a bit to the New York uh, High Line, which is another railroad stretch that had been um, uh, turned into a, a public park. Here, there's no gardens, there's no anything, there's nothing to distract you. It's sort of minimalist. But uh, the one, the joy is you can look over the side and you can, um, you can still see the coral and the, the fish darting between. And uh, I, I saw a turtle there. Um, there's five you know, types of turtle in, in the area of which um, the most famous is that the loggerhead uh, turtle, which was named after uh, the sailors used to yell out, you know, they'd see something and they would call it um, loggerhead. Uh, it was actually a, a, this giant, the backs of the turtles. But you can see sharks if you're, if you're lucky, uh, black tip and, and nurse sharks. And uh, stingrays, everyone loves to see the stingrays because they're huge and they leap out of the water there. Um, so it's, it's, quite, it's quite a lovely experience. And you can, you can rent a bike and they have a little trolley now if you don't want to walk the 2.2 uh, the miles, you can, um, you can do, go along there. And you, as you go up to the end, uh, they, they, there used to be a sort of a, a drawbridge, you know, a sort of a swing bridge there after two, point two, after two and a half miles. So it was becoming dangerous. So they actually t stopped that. So you can only go to, up to a certain point. Uh, the, the other five miles is still in um, decay, unfortunately. There's no plans to sort of put those together uh, at the moment. But uh, if, if the park works out successfully, Maybe they will because the um, much of the actual structure is still intact. Uh, so when you get to the end, however, there's this like nice little curved thing that goes down, a little walkway that goes down to Pigeon Key uh, there, and so it's, it's a very you know charming. And you can see the um, the modern bridge uh, whirring away over there. And as you walk down, you can see some of the houses because it used to be um, back, back in uh, from 1900. Uh, eight to nine, it was a workers camp. And there'd be like 400 men based there. Uh, and they were like working on the, on the bridge and the vintage cottages are still down there. And there's like seabirds and pelicans and it's very, very serene and beautiful. And uh, you can actually get a little boat uh, going there to, to Key West. It's a little irregular, but that's another way of, of going there. And uh, the, the guy who runs it is uh, Kelly McKinnon. And he's the uh, director of the uh, Pigeon Key Found Key Pigeon Key Foundation. Uh, so it's a nonprofit that looks after the renovations of the whole place, uh, which was kind of a major project. Um, and uh, there was a small ribbon cutting ceremony back uh, when it opened on January the twelfth, and. Uh, it, it was, they thought it was going to be kind of a small event, but it was mobbed because uh, uh, it's, the place is so beloved. And uh, they used to have little events there uh, before it closed in, 20, in um, 2016. And they would get like 200, over 200,000 visitors a year. But now um, it's become quite popular. So it can be really quite busy, you know, and they do things like TED Talks there and um, 
Uh, they have fun runs, they have parties. You can rent the whole island for, for uh, festivities if you want. Uh, and it was saving the whole, saving the island was, it was kind of a community effort, which I thought was kind of charming because the, um, the state was really letting the, the bridge fall to bits uh like the other bridges you know like just just slowly decaying and sort of becoming you know these sort of beautiful ruins that you could admire from a distance and they were going to let the, the seven mile bridge uh, go the same way but uh, uh there was these history loving locals got together and they formed a group called sos save old seven and that became the friends of old seven uh, and they managed to somehow get uh, the Florida, uh, sort of an alliance, you know, uh, to finance it, the Florida Department of Transportation, the, the Monroe County, which is there, and, uh, and the city of Marathon uh, managed to combine money because they realized that, you know, 200,000 people coming a year to this place was quite a, it was quite important for the town of Marathon. Uh, so, um, you know, there was some things that it was it, it was it would have impressed uh, Flagler actually the way they did it because in over six years they had to um, uh, they managed they had to uh, lift up uh, each uh, each chunk of the um, of the railroad of the uh, of the of the steel and replace the girders the basis the concrete uh, the concrete basis uh, and the the major metal basis only needed sort of a scrape but the the girders needed to be replaced. And um, they had to, yeah, they were doing it every like 10 feet and then like fixing it all up to make it a little more solid. But eventually they just, they, they did it and they opened it, um, uh, opened it on time. And if you go down there, apart from it being a very charming sort of uh, otherworldly place, which is um, uh, often used by school groups, uh, you know, there's this sort of a, a little marine biology schools that can stay there. Uh, they have a little, they, they, the original schoolhouse has been turned into a, a lovely little museum. And uh, for me, it was great because I, you know, I vaguely knew about the, the story, but going there and sort of, they've, they've got this, these beautiful exhibits there, including models and uh, photographs. And you're able to actually learn uh, just how crazy the whole thing was. I mean, this is sort of like a, a, a beautiful photograph of coming down through Florida uh, you know, like which was in, in, still incredibly wild, as you can see. And um, these are some workers uh, on the uh, on the bridge itself, which uh, uh, you know it, it was kind of uh, it, it was just lovely to see it and you know, see it in, in, in place. And I learned a bit more about Flagler, um, just how crazy it was that he was seventy five years old and he decided to uh, invest his considerable money into this project. It was um, entirely untested. Now, a lot of the engineering had to be made up as they went along. And uh, he could have retired because he, he had started Standard Oil with Rockefeller uh, you know, back in the uh, 1890s and made millions and millions of dollars and could easily have just um, lived in luxury. Uh, but instead, he, he in, in this sort of very Gilded Age way, just wanted more and more challenges, more and more... Uh, um, you know, uh, creations, uh, I guess. Uh, for example, he built a beautiful house in Palm Beach, uh, which back then there was, there was nothing there. There was like a, you know, one street and he created this whole, uh, this resort. Uh, he just liked the beach. Uh, then uh, in Miami, he, he built like the first uh, hotel there and the, one of those streets in downtown is named after Flagler. Uh, his house in um, in Palm Beach is this is a incredible looking um, uh, uh, museum, as the one in Tampa is for the uh, uh, for the other Robert Barron um, uh, Henry Plant. It looks like something out of Istanbul with these enormous towers and things around it. It's quite uh, this Moorish want uh, uh, Spanish Moorish uh, uh, confection. Anyway, so they started, they, 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 they were all setting off, all the workers are going down there. And, uh, you know, he was derided in the press for this plan, you know, uh, this, and one of the, one, I liked one of the press, um, uh, uh, the journalist said uh, um, that he was, all he was trying to do was link these coral clumps, uh, which were worthless, chaotic fragments that have aptly been called sweepings and debris, which the creator uh, hurled out to sea when he had finished shaping Florida. So it was, con it was considered this mangrove, mosquito-ridden 
uh, waste of time, basically. But Flagler realized that um, you know he had he had much larger plans. Uh, what it, what you know his motivation in many ways was was something of a mystery. So uh, and even to this day, because he was a very he was very Presbyterian, very uh, waspy. He was he grew up in upstate New York. He, in the manner of the day, he never spoke about his personal feelings or his dreams, or if he did, they were in sort of kind of abstract terms, uh, unlike um, our, uh, you know, IT uh, geniuses today. They, they're very sort of, he's something of an enigma, this character. He, he reminds me a little bit of, uh, there was a movie, There Will Be Blood, uh, made about a robber baron uh, in California. And, in the, and to the end of the movie, you don't entirely know what motivates him. Uh, so, there's a, an author who wrote the great book on the, on the on the train. It's called The Last Train to Paradise. And his name's Les Standiford. And he you know, speculates on what was going on in um, uh, on this guy's head. And some thought it, he in one theory was that he wanted to impress his wife, his third wife. Uh, his, her name was Mary Lily Kernan, uh, and uh, she, who was 37 years younger than he was. So uh, he, the, the idea was, one idea was that he just wanted to sort of astonish her with his sort of, uh, his genius. Uh, another one was that uh, Rockefeller, by this stage, was much more famous uh, than Flagler was. So he wanted to sort of uh, uh, make it, you know, put his name into history and sort of create something that everyone would remember and sort of, you know, overshadow Rockefeller, perhaps, in the history books. Uh, it would also make a lot of money. Uh, and I don't think we can really um, sentimentalize uh, sentimentalize it. He really what he wanted to do is get this train line going down to uh, Key West and then link to Cuba and then link to the Panama Canal. And so all the the, the bounty of South America uh, and Latin America would flood up through uh, and under this train, in which he would take a, a huge cut. And uh, they would bring uh, you know, he could take uh, all sorts of manufactured goods down to Latin America and bring back, you know, cigars and sugar and fish and fruit and all the great things that's um, of Latin America. But in, in the end, when I was in reading about him, I, 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 and I say this in the story, there's something sort of in, in, in just the challenge of the sheer challenge appeal to people uh, in the Gilded Age. And um, the mountaineer, George Mallory was very famous. He, you know, he was asked why he um, wanted to climb uh, Mount Everest, and he and he said because it's there, and uh, I think the strange, and because it killed him in 1923, he died doing it. But this sort of this sense of challenge and overcoming nature uh, was sort of part of the 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 allure. But even so, he said he, you know, he sets this up. Uh, he gets going, uh, uh, and uh, three thousand workers are hired, and they uh, many of them quit uh, fairly quickly because it was just. Uh, miserable. It was mosquitoes and um, the heat and the rain and uh, just going through sludge and mud. And, um, you know, there were three hurricanes that hit, uh, one in 1906, one in 1909, and one in 1910. And the first one, uh, drowned at least 125 workers. They don't even know uh, exactly how many because they were all living in uh, uh, houseboats. I, and there's a photo here of, uh, you know, they're all crammed into these houseboats and the houseboats tragically became unmoored and they like swept out and uh, overturned and all these um, workers drowned. So you're giving incredibly bad PR, obviously. And, um, you know, uh, giving... You know, there were even um, anti-slavery charges that were brought out against Flagler uh, in, in New York State because, um, you know, there, there were rumours that he was, like, just uh, uh, basically imprisoning his workers. Um, but uh, anyway, I'll, uh, you know, and yet the work went on and then the Seven Mile Bridge, you can see it being made here. And what they were doing was uh, putting down these, these, you know, creating this sort of, case and then filling it with concrete and like creating these pylons along the way which then they would then uh, overlay with um, iron girders uh, they needed 746 of these um, bridge supports to be brought over by barge and it was such a you know extraordinary project because engineers had never done anything like it and so journalists would go down and one of them said it was like launching a railroad straight at the blank horizon of the Atlantic it was literally going out into uh into you know into nothing 
Uh, and one, one of the images that I loved hearing, you know, someone was explaining that they, they, they tried to, you know, they'd done a chart and they estimated how much it might cost for Flegler. And when they actually went down there, for example, they found that there was a whole one mile stretch of water that didn't, that wasn't even on the maps. So adding, all of this adding, you know, ballooning the cost. No one really knows how much in the end, end it cost. But they had to barge out these, so the iron support spans uh, and linking it all up. And uh, miraculously, you know, it gets done on time in 1909 and they plow on, plow on over the most difficult uh, parts down to uh, Key West. Uh, and that's more of the images of the pylons once they, once they get it going. It's kind of uh, extraordinary, but uh, you know, more or less you know, a little bit, but a little bit late. But in, on January the twenty first in nineteen twelve, uh, and then they pushed ahead because Flegler is is getting old. He wants to see this done before he dies, and you know he's uh, uh, you know, really um, you know putting everything into this uh, and going into going into debt as well. So anyone on. It's all set up on January the 21st, 1912. Huge crowds gather uh, in Key West, the whole island, basically. And in those days, I, I hadn't realized myself that it was like it was a it was a huge port, a thriving sort of port. And it was like, you know, second only to New Orleans, really. And it's sort of uh, uh, you know, the, the you know, the, the number of sailors living and working there. Um, but the first train comes down from New York and Flegler you know, and his wife, uh, his young wife are there in their private uh, carriage, which is, a, which is a beautifully luxurious Pullman carriage with a copper roof and, you know, there's a beautiful dining rooms and um, there's so, only a couple of them have ever survived, but the level of luxury of American uh, uh, train carriages was famous. The Pullman ones, you know, uh, had, had been, um, you know, they were they outstripped anything in Europe. That was deliberately, uh, you know, deliberately the height of luxury with their own chefs and uh, dining cars and the whole thing. And and it was it was considered that everyone knew that it was like an extraordinary leap ahead in transportation. Uh, I, the comparison might be the the Golden Spike, you know, that was driven in um, when the the two lines, the two train, the transcontinental lines meet in Utah in 1869. There was like an extraordinary photographs of when that meets and the first train goes through to, to San Francisco. Extraordinary thing. So anyway, Flagler's going down, but at this stage he's 82 years old and um, uh, he has, uh, you know, his, his eyesight's really failing and, uh, uh, you know, and yet it's an incredible sense of uh, exuberance and joy. He goes there and he hears this sort of crowd of 10,000 people cheering and there's brass bands and there's uh, this extraordinary sort of uh, enthusiasm. These the school children invent, you know, they come up with um, special songs um, to, um, you know, to thank Flegler for doing this extraordinary thing for Florida. And uh, he said he was there, he had to be supported by one of his uh, workers, Joseph Parrott, uh, one of his engineers. And he said that I, I can hear the school children, but I can't see them. Uh, even so, it was kind of uh, kind of extraordinary crowning achievement for him. And he told he also said that now I can die happy. My dream is fulfilled. Uh, and he did die. He, like a year later, he um, he passed away. But uh, um, and then it became, you know, extra, an ex a very successful, extraordinary sort of thing. And uh, uh, if you go to the museum, they've got these like envelopes, souvenir envelopes, you know, the, 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 ex the overseas extension. And people in New York, you know, it was an extraordinary thing. This is like from 1933. Um, and everyone wanted to come down. Um, there was a flash, I moved that ahead too fast. But um, there was this incredible sort of blaze of glory for 20 years where it's like uh, beloved. Uh, you know, especially during Prohibition, they're making a good deal of money uh, going down there. Um, and uh, uh, Flegler didn't realise that uh, he, he died not knowing that uh, despite all uh, the success, it was never actually turning, turning a buck. It wasn't really um, making any money uh, because the, the dream that he had of, uh, of the Panama Canal and all going through Key West didn't really um, eventuate. Um, but Things got worse, uh, uh, ra ra radically worse in uh, 1935. So on Labor Day, this hurricane comes hurtling down on, uh, on the Keys 
And one of the residents in Florida Keys, you know, he, in this laconic sort of way said, um, we saw pretty quickly that this was going to be a son of a bitch. And in fact, um, Ernest Hemingway, who was living there, you know, they, everyone realised that this is sort of an unprecedented storm was coming. Uh, even so, there's all these residents along the Keys and they didn't, you know, you, you know in, in this sort of disorganised fashion, they didn't sort of think of what to do, or any you know, rescue plan or anything, uh, which would prove extremely tragic. So uh, Ernest Hemingway was living in um, the Florida Keys at that stage. And uh, I, I don't know if anyone's been down there, but his, his mansion is a, a beautiful, um, is preserved beautifully. And it's got this swimming pool and his gardens and all these uh, cats, these six-toed cats that are there. And they're like, uh, there's dozens of them. So it's, it's really kind of a charming thing to do. Um, but he secured his, you know, tied down his fishing boat, the Pilar, that he you know, would go over to Cuba with and um, sort of hunker down expecting the worst. But the, um, the hurricane didn't hit uh, Key West. It, it, it hit somewhere called Matacum Key, um, which is further north, uh, where a lot of residents were just living in these fishing shacks. And very tragically, uh, there were 600 war veterans you know, from the First World War who'd been hired to sort of do repairs on the, on the uh, railroad along the way. And uh, they were just living in canvas tents. And this, this, this hurricane hits, and it's, um, it's still to this day the strongest hurricane that's hit the United States uh, with 200 miles per hour uh, winds, which when I was reading about it, it's almost impossible to imagine what that really means. Uh, but it's like the, the sea is crashing over these very small keys. We saw the photos of just how, you know, you know low, to, low to the, Earth, these low to the ocean these these keys are some of them are just like swept away effectively and uh, everything that's loose turns into this this this, this missile so uh, one guy um, described the scene and there was there was bodies with tree tree stumps smashed through their chests and there were heads blown off uh, twisted arms and legs uh, torn off by flying timbers that turned into like flying knives um, and there was a rescue train that was finally sent out uh, uh, from uh, Miami, but it took so long to get there, it, uh, it arrived too late. So just when it arrived, a 17 foot tidal wave crashed over. So all the people who were meant to be rescued uh, who were on the, on the train. And so they were crashed over, it, it just got crashed over and swept away. And um, most of the people were, were just drowned in the carriages, but those who managed to get out through the smashed windows was swept further out to sea and drowned. And um, uh, Ernest Hemingway was one of the people who went uh, on the relief mission uh, once, the, once the, the, the storm had ended. And he gives these very, in, in these letters, he didn't publish them, but in these letters, he described just um, uh, how terrible it was, this sort of scene of devastation. Uh, he went there with food, you know, in boats, you know, with food to try and um, help the survivors but he found no survivors he said he found nothing but dead men to eat the grub uh and he talked about the trees that you know had no leaves and uh, the earth you know was now covered in sand and dead crayfish, crayfish and you know uh, moray eels there and um you know he said the whole bottom of the sea was was tossed up uh, and there was bodies 30 feet up in the tree branches, you know, and then it, it took, you know, weeks to get the, the you know, the, the clear of this, this sort of gruesome, grisly sort of um, scene out. And, and one of the images, uh, this is kind of a horrifying image, but it, people would be st stuck and then the, the winds was, would whip up the sands and the sands would actually take the, the skin off people's faces, um, you know, strip them down to, they were dead by then, uh, Presumably, but they stripped them down to uh, the bone. So uh, uh, basically, Flegler's dream uh, was gone. It was just swept away. Uh, and uh, there was no way, it was way too expensive to rebuild it, uh, rebuild the railroad. So uh, his company sold it off for 640000 which is, um, you know, a tenth of what uh, it probably cost to build the thing. Um, and base, and so it was left just standing there for um, for maybe two years, and then by 1938 they realized that in the the next step was to pave pave it over and turn it into a um, a highway for the automobiles that were by then 
the main, you know, becoming outstripping the trains as their favorite American uh, form of transportation. Um, they still hadn't built the, you know, the interstates were being built in the 50s. And so uh, it became another, you know, a, a, another great uh, uh, transport um, experience, but it was extremely narrow. And people used to talk about it was, it, it was you know, um, it was, it was like hair raising to drive down because cars could be hit, just squeeze past two ways and because it was an accident you would go over or, the, or it would just block the um the highway for uh uh for, for days until they cleared it up so it's quite quite something so anyway um it's it, there's that tragic loss of things everything sort of is is uh, uh it, you know this this sort of thing where it, it's it's there and then by the 1990s, it's formed, it's formed, the 1980s, it's formed a bit so much that they build a, a new um, highway in parallel. And then it's, and now it's kind of, it's quite, uh, quite pleasant. It's not only nowhere near as dangerous to drive. Still, if there's an accident, it can block it for, um, you know, for uh, a day, uh, which is kind of, kind of disastrous. And yet when you go down to Key West, um, for me in the journey, when you roll in there, it's still it's still kind of an amazing experience to go down there. It's, it's you know mile zero of Highway One, uh, and you can go and it's 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 kind of such a uh, a wild and charming place. And and the one I would definitely recommend that if you go down there to go to uh, this this hotel, the last Flagler funded hotel was called, is the Casa Marina. It's basically the end of the line right on this beach. Uh, very very. Um, very beautiful. Uh, it, it opened in 1921, so Flagler was was dead by then. But uh, still, it was part of his, you know, the, the railroad company's sort of grand dream. Um, and Key West is kind of marvelous because you can get they've got there's a beach right in town that's uh, it's just like the Caribbean. You know, it is effectively the Caribbean. And um, things like the Green Parrot Bar and, you know, all this, it, it still does, even though it can get, it's like this huge party town, it still has this sort of charming element. Um, and, you know, million, you know, millions go down to watch the sunset. It's kind of a, it's kind of a, it's kind of a scene. But, um, oh, wow, I don't have, uh, I had some images of, uh, uh, they preserved um, the train station there, the um, the, the 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 final uh, stop, and they've turned it into a little museum. And there is, in fact, a statue of uh, Flagler there, um, whose photo uh, I'll see if I can find it in a minute. I might be able to. It might not have uh, in my uh, my brilliant uh, uh, Mac presentation. It seems to have fallen off. But there's a little statue in in, if it, in the museum of him sort of sitting there, and you know he's got his moustache and his cane just sitting there and most people don't know who he is that you know, th you know thousands of people walk past this statue every day and they go into the marina to the to the bars and the all you can drink you know bars and the buffets or whatever and the and the yachts that go out uh this very exciting you know all this so sort of, they don't realize that flagler you know was responsible for all this but if you go into the museum it does have in you know, these beautiful exhibitions and uh and if you go to the casa marina as well inside there's a little um in, in a corner there's a statue of flagler sitting there and um it's always sort of i think it's kind of poignant to sort of go by and, and notice him um because most people they, they simply don't and in some ways you can see it is very tragic that um uh you know that the railroad railroad was swept aside but you know i, I was thinking uh i i sort of think that it, his dream did sort of come true in the end, in, in the sense that the, the Keys became this extremely uh, beloved, sort of very democratic sort of uh, destination. And, you know, millions of Americans, you know, come from the, from the snowy north uh, the, and, you know, get some escape and some relief, uh, even though you can fly direct to um, Key West these days, uh, you can still, you can still go down and have have a taste of this incredible sort of natural environment that the um, that the keys offer, and uh, uh, so I think that in itself is sort of a monument to um, uh, to uh, to Flagler, and as well as the the Seven Mile Beach, uh, Seven Mile Bridge, um, which you know to be able to go along the old Seven and just to go to Pigeon Key, I think is uh, is just one of the the great travel experiences. Uh, 
that uh, I hope will inspire maybe them saving some of the rest of the of the bridge. But uh, let's see, maybe I can try and find these other photos. Should I try and do that? Um, how can I do that? Uh, or would that be, uh, uh, or do you want to take questions while I sort of doodle around? Well, yeah, doodle? you can. we can absolutely do both. Um, yeah. We have a bunch of questions, actually. Um, let's exit full screen. Oh, OK. How are we doing there? Let's see. I wonder what happened to those. I guess my technological, uh, wow. Well, Maybe okay. it's just too many photos for my Mac to, uh, to, to, to put in. But that's OK. Well, let's, let's leave that one and we do the Q&A then. OK. <laughs> yeah. So um, this, this is fascinating. Oh, my goodness. I had no idea at all the um, events that went down there. Um, one question is, I think you might have answered it, but how does one get to the Keys? And um, you said you could fly there directly to Key West, but um, is the best way to drive? Because Key West is all in the back, on the bottom of it, right? The, yeah, the, yeah. The Key West is the last stop. It's yeah. the last stop. So I would recommend flying to Miami and, um, you know, staying in either the Biltmore or, um, I mean, the, the Art Deco uh, hotels and along... Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Miami Beach are beautiful. You know, there's the Fontainebleau, you know, from the 50s, but a lot of the others are from the 20s and 30s. Um, uh, it's fun. I think Miami's great fun. I know it um, uh, used to have a sort of a dubious reputation, but uh, uh, a sort of a bit of a, 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 a little dangerous or whatever, like 20 years ago, but now it's great fun. And, uh, and it, and it has like wee little historical things that are there from the old days. There's uh, one of the original hotels on the, on the Miami River is still there and uh, it's a little restaurant. But uh, you can go there and, and, and rent a car and just like get onto, onto Highway 1. And, it, you know, you can, you can do it in like uh, four hours if you, if, you don't, if you just put your foot to the, to the pedal and drive down. But, um, you know, uh, I would stay overnight um, and... Isla Mirada is another place, one of these other villages that's uh, is is sort of like Key West without the crowds. But Marathon's the the logical one, and that uh, you know it has a few little hotels as well as the um, the Isla Bella Hotel, which is you know kind of is a, it's it's expensive but and luxurious but extremely pleasant. And if you stay in these, you can literally walk to the um, uh, uh, to the Seven Mile Ridge. It's just like uh, it's just right there, and and that's you know worth a couple of nights and and then and then drive down and um because there's other there's these little beaches that are um let's just have a look uh there's little beaches that are uh uh you know they're kind of extraordinary you know, then they're right underneath these bridges and um uh that's another question is how um another question is um how yeah. low is the bridge to the water it's a seven mile bridge. It's 65 feet, 65 feet there. You know, so it's kind of like you're up there and, you know, it's a long uh, fishing <laughs> fishing drop, but uh, yeah, you can see very clearly the the coral and, and whatever. Some of the other things were, were lower and some were a little higher and, and you know, um, depending on the things and some, and of course some, of course some of it's on, you know, like on Key Largo, it's actually on dry land, but yeah, like 65 feet there. For some reason, I'm going to, I'm going to show this Let's see if I can show this photo. I mean, this is this is one that I thought was cute. It's like if you go to the Hemingway house. This is Hemingway when he was young, uh, around the time where he went to um, uh, uh, Key West, and it was like he he always had things drop on his head. He um, it, ha it happened like ten times in his life, and he was he was kind of accident prone, which is kind of funny given his sort of uh, somewhat heroic sort of life. And uh, uh, yeah, he, this one he was trying to fix a. Um, um, a, a fan on the roof and, a, and it smashed the skylight with sheeted glass fell on his head. Oh, uh, but I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, and look, I'll show you, look, okay. There's this, this is a, a postcard from when they finally paved it over. Um, you know, and so it became kind of a, it, it actually is, I, I believe it's actually narrower than that. Uh, the way people talk about it sounds, it's much more hair raising. It looks like, oh, Two, two ways, but it was still kind of a spectacular thing. Uh, this is like, I think it's from the 50s. And um, oh, actually the late 30s, because it says it's new. And, I, and this is another one that I wanted to show. And this is uh, Bahia Onda. Uh, so if you go south of uh, Marathon, 
you end up at um, this, this little state park beyond a, you know, another islet. And uh, that was like the beyond a bridge, which is spectacular. You know, it's like uh, uh, another one that it was just too tall, too, too difficult to maintain. And they, so they, they, they broke it to stop people getting onto it. I believe locals sometimes you know, climb up somehow onto these things. I, it, it looks um, terrifying, but uh, you can walk up a little bit of the way there, as you can see. And they sort of stop people uh, up there, but you can sort of get a sense of it. But it's lovely just going down there. And it's sort of a, it's a wildlife preserve. So they have these extraordinary, they have these butterflies and um, these unique birds that are just in this little, this one little place. And uh, uh, and it's charming for, you know, it's, it's a great way to, you know, to, to break the journey. Uh, so if you have any other questions, I want to just see what, I don't know. Sure, why. sure. Um, oh, here's, here's one. Okay, I'll show you this one. This is the, the statue of Flagler at the uh, Casa Marina. And it's, uh, I mean, it doesn't, it's, it's fun. he's got this terrible expression, uh, but that's the, um, the, the, his, the, the hotel actually has its own, its own historian. Um, I don't know if you can even see it properly, but. Um, uh, yep, you can see it, absolutely. Oh, great. Well, um, uh, yeah, it's, just, it's a nice thing to go in there. It's just this statue in a corner in this photograph, um, you know, and, and the historian will go around and tell people uh, the history of the, um, uh, uh, of the of the hotel but you know and you can just step out and there's this beautiful beach where they'll serve dinner right on the beach and or you can go rent a jet ski and go zooming around or like uh, whatever and it's like uh it's this very sort of you know it's sort of like a tropical paradise in its own weird way you know it's kind of like you can do you know have cocktails you can do whatever you like because it's it really is um his version of the dream um it's so funny. There's, I, I had the, uh, let's see if I, oh, yeah, look, here's Flagler Station. Ah. For some reason, that didn't end up either. Okay, well, this is the one in Key West. It's, it's just this tiny little train station, and, and it's where the train pulled up, and you go onto the steamer. And this statue of Flagler looking very uh, relaxed. You can sit down there and have a photograph. Here, um, there's, a, you know, there's a bit of garbage throwing around. I remember going down there because there had been a storm the night before and the whole of Key West had lost power. Um, and so it was paralyzed for a day. And uh, people were getting, you know, they, you know there was, it, it, so there was sort of debris everywhere. And this was just like, you know, um, just a, a weird um, January storm, but, uh, but kind of charming that, you know, you know, that, uh, uh, charming, it's probably not so charming if you live there, but uh, uh, it's still sort of vulnerable to the elements, this, uh, this, this, this island is still quite isolated, but if you go there, you've got you can have this. So you can go there. It's even got the railway um, thing for the Havana Special because you can go there and go straight across the uh, uh, the pier and just jump. So, on. are those all places the um, the train that left Penn Station would stop on its way to Florida? Yeah, wacky, right? Uh, yeah, let me go back. That was the uh, that uh, was. So you get on at Penn Station. Yeah, and you get in all these sort of. And places. you would stop in Washington, D.C., in Savannah, yeah. Jacksonville, St. Augustine. Yeah. yeah. And like, you know, uh, if you wanted to break the journey in Miami, you could do that or, you know, um, just kind of. Uh, oh, yeah. And then finally, the, the, you'd, you'd leave uh, Key West and arrive in Havana. You know, it's kind of like uh, and then the other way, you know. Um, How you far know? did they get to the next station? You know, he wanted to go to he wanted to build a train a railroad system that went to Havana and beyond, you said. So how far, you know, how far did they get? You know, uh, not very far. No, he wanted, what he wanted uh, really was um, if you go, to go into Havana and then the boat would then go to uh, Panama. So the, uh -huh. uh, you know, the, he, the, he, there were ideas of having, I mean, there was a um, American owned train lines there that would go from Havana to Santiago uh, in the East and to Pina del Rio um, in the West. Uh, so they would go to the tip of the you know, island and Santiago was a port as well. They could then go to, um, you know, the other Caribbean islands. But uh, my understanding is his vision was you go to Havana, hang out in Havana, and then you can get a boat. It's sort of just easier just to get a boat straight from Havana because Havana is one of the great ports of the Western Hemisphere. You know, the Spanish um, used it as their, you know, their major uh, base for the, getting um, the, the galleons, you know, to uh, bring back... Um, 
uh, gold and silver from um, from from the across the across South America, from Mexico as well, and uh, it, that was the the, the the galleons would all the armada would all gather there. So it's this amazing um, harbor. So uh, uh, the idea was that boats could you know get in there, load and unload, go to um, Key West, and uh, take it from there. But, so uh, interesting. Yeah. And, and do you know of anything about the most recent hurricane that really did a lot of damage? On it did a lot of damage, coast? but um, you know, uh, Pigeon Key, you know, they closed down for a week, uh, and then um, you know they they had volunteers cleaning up and stuff. But it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't pummeled uh, the way other parts of uh, uh, the area were. So uh, uh, everything was sort of intact. They have had other hurricanes where. Um, uh was it Irma that uh uh it's you know it really hit them and took off the roofs of um you know the the antique buildings um you know but they, they you know volunteers getting together and uh uh repairing it you know because it's it is very beloved it's very sort of um you know there's um you know, it's like an extraordinary uh, outpost and so there's a lot of outpouring of enthusiasm um uh, for that and so I think they managed to re repair it in fairly good order so it's uh, the actual structures are, um, are still original which is which is great and how um, if you're going to do a trip of the keys how many days should you um, allow for I think in, in the beginning you said four but uh, you, yeah, a um, you know I reckon uh, it depends how long you want to stay in Key West you know if you if you took a week from Miami you know, I mean, if you if you have a, if you have a week, you know, you can you can go to down to Miami and drive back. People do it in a day; they drive down and drive back. It's a very long day, but you know that you can do it. You don't you don't see anything. But if you go down, you know, you go to Miami, you spend a night in Miami. It's like it's it's fun. Um, go to Little Havana, you know, it's like, it's kind of cool. And then go down, spend a couple of nights in Marathon, a night in Isla Mirada, or whatever, and then go down to Key West for um, you know, you can easily spend. I think three nights is good in Key West. You know, um, there's tons of stuff there. There's, uh, you know, quite quite fascinating little museums and uh, little art galleries and bookstores. Uh, the beach there and the uh, there's a restaurant. You know, really nice restaurants and just going the rituals of going and watching the sunset. You know, on, on the on the beach there is you know it's it's kind of fun. It has a lot of charm. And then take a day to drive back, you know, and stop on the way and have, uh, you know, um, a seafood lunch. At, um, there's there's a couple of really great places. There's, you know, that are, um, you know, they're on marinas and, uh, you know, they, they, they go out and get the, the catch and they bring it back and they cook it up there. It's basically a, 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 a fish shop and a wholesale fish shop. You can go in and there's a little, little storefront. You order things and they'll cook it up for you on the spot. And there's one place that does these amazing... Um, uh sushi jesus what's his name um I, I write about it in the wall street journal magazines and uh, the wall street journal story so if you put in my name in wall street journal it comes up but there's this guy um and he uh because there's the, the invasive lionfish has come into the keys it, you know it was, it was brought there from uh uh from asia i believe and uh um it's sort of taking over and destroying and killing a lot of the um the coral and the, the fish there because it's got these incredible spikes it's an amazing looking uh creature uh like sort of terrifying looking um but very deadly spikes and and, and there's no real defense against it so it's killing it's really wiping out a lot of the um uh the marine life so they go down there and um they spear it and they collect it and they serve it up as sushi in the um in this restaurant and it's uh and that's in uh, in Marathon. That's kind of a, an awesome place. Uh, you know, things like that, very quirky. And the guy who runs it's like a real character. He's sort of a Hemingway-esque sort of figure. And, you know, um, uh, things like that are well worth, you know, stopping for. And uh, there's a turtle, um, uh, you know, a, a, a Save the Turtles institution, also in Marathon, that you go there and they, they rescue turtles that have been injured uh, either by motorboats or by cars or whatever, um, as well as um, or by pollution, you know, because they can actually affect um, turtles. So they go there and there's a rehabilitation. They have a little um, a little hospital for turtles, and you go there and it's all it's all volunteers again. And so I think I think it's a thirty dollar donation, and you can go in there 
and you can see all these beautiful turtles swimming around there's baby turtles there's big turtles and whoever saves the turtle and you know Florida Key resident residents find these injured turtles and bring them there and they're allowed to name the turtle and so one seven-year-old called the turtle what was it little fat Brianna uh, is the name of the that's the name of the so it's like they, all these sort of quirky um very uh you know eccentric little keys things that they do and my last question what would be your favorite key of all of them oh well i would have to go with pigeon key because it's like okay. you really um haven't you know uh it's really got this otherworldly atmosphere and it's like it really is a step back in time as well as the serenity of it i think you can hear the humming of the highway the traffic on the highway nearby but it has a sort of a a dreamy quality that I think you can sort of like wander around, just sit underneath a palm tree and sort of um, get lost in your thoughts. So it's very, very, uh, it's very charming. Oh, that's great. Well, this has been terrific. Thank you so much for sharing all your wealth of knowledge about uh, the old Seven Mile Bridge, Henry Flagler, and uh, the history of the trains down there. It's just fascinating. And um, I hope everyone enjoyed this and stay tuned for more. Thank you again, Tony. Thank you for having me. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you, Dave. Thank you.